let us pray. Now, Father God, we ask you this morning to help us as we look to Christ Jesus as an example, as we look to him in his humility. Lord, when we recognize that you, by your nature, are of infinite value, of infinite worth, that you are infinitely transcendent and great, beyond all things, beyond comprehension, that you would then choose to come, the person of Jesus Christ, in human flesh, to be like us, to live and to dwell amongst us, to face temptation far greater than most of us will ever face, to be surrounded by sin and depravity in a wicked generation of a wicked culture. To do all that, Lord, is great, great humility. But to then take that and to willingly offer himself on the cross, that most cursed of deaths, that we, who are sinners, might have an opportunity to be forgiven and be saved and to live. Lord, that is humility that no human mind could truly grasp. And so, Lord, we need your help. If we are to follow that example, if we are to live as he lived, if we are to practice in even some small example of that humility, Lord, we need you. And so, Lord, I ask that you would humble us this morning as we gather in worship, that you would humble us as we interact with each other and have fellowship with each other, that you would humble us as we come before your word, that you would humble us as we offer you our simple praises. Lord, for all these things, we ask you them in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we open up God's word this morning for our scripture reading, I invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And I'd like to read verses 9 through 21 with you this morning. Romans 12, starting in verse 9. Let love be genuine Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let us pray. Father God, I ask that you would help us to achieve the high calling, the high standard that you have set forth here through the pen of the Apostle Paul, through the moving of the Holy Spirit as he wrote these words. Lord, I believe that these were words written to a church in Rome in the first century. 
but I also believe that these were words written to those of us here today in the 21st century. Lord, I ask that you would help us to love each other, to cling to what is good, to face the evil that we encounter in this life with good, to not fight fire with fire, but to pursue holiness and righteousness and goodness and love and mercy at all points. Help us, Lord, as we face evil in this life to look like fools to the world when we respond with goodness. Help us to look and seem strange as we face evil in this life. And Lord, help us to live peaceably with even each other, to do what is honorable even when it's just us gathered together. Lord, help us to remember those dear saints that may not be with us this morning, those that are homebound, those that have scheduling conflicts or other things that come up and get in the way. Lord, I pray that they would have a blessed and wonderful day as they remember you and your wonderful works. Lord, I ask that you would be with Elaine in the coming days. She has scheduled October 7th uh, procedure to be done. Uh, focused on the heart. And Lord, we know that this is a procedure. This is a surgery that she wanted to avoid. That she was not even sure she would go through with. But Lord, we're thankful that you have given her some sense of peace. And Lord, we ask that you would increase that sense of peace. That you would help her to go forward in faith. To trust and rely on your goodness in these times. Lord, may there be wisdom for doctors and nurses and medical professionals, for all involved. May you grant them some special gift that they might impart healing to Elaine. Lord, we also thank you for the healing that is happening with Deep. It's such, a, it's such good news to hear a positive report that healing is continuing and that she is improving daily. Lord, that is a blessing to which we thank you and humbly thank you for that. Lord, I also thank you for some bit of healing or temporary relief in Mike's life. Mike being Elisa's sort of cousin-in-law who's battling leukemia and we prayed for a week ago as he was struggling and now seems to be doing better. Lord, that is an answer to prayer and we thank you for that. Lord, we pray that you would continue to give him healing, good, positive days as he fights what oftentimes seems like an impossible battle. Lord, all these things, we come before you humbly, praying in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, for announcements, a couple things to mention. We, of course, have a time of fellowship after the service. I'm hoping I'm not too long-winded. I'd like to get Sunday school after that started a bit. Uh, maybe early, like 10.45 is maybe my goal for today to get that started. We'll see how time lines up when we get there. But uh, Elise and I and the kids have to leave, like, firmly at 11.30. So that's uh, – if I'm not out of here, if I stay late again, uh, I'm going to have to face the wrath of Elise, which is uh, – Something I don't want to deal with today. So I promised her 11.30 for a leave time. Uh, so that's the plan for fellowship Sunday school after that. But thinking ahead to next week, next week we will be doing communion together. We have an opportunity to share that small but important meal together as we reflect on what Christ has done for us. So I want to give you that week of warning, uh, if you will, or heads up, I should say, uh, just so you can prepare your hearts, prepare your spirits for that meal that we share together next week. But that's really all I have in way of announcements, so I'm going to turn it back over to the worship team. If you were to ask the people in my life who I really get to talk to about ministry, about my goals and my desires and my ideals, when it comes to ministry, they might suggest to you, upon looking at it, that this passage today must be 
one of my favorite passages. And that's not because I reference it often or even really reference it at all in those conversations, or even because I'm considerably mindful of this passage myself. That is, I don't really necessarily think of it specifically often. I do not bring it up in conversation directly, but I do reference the themes of this passage over and over and over again. That is to say, I am wholeheartedly devoted to unity in the church and humility. And in my everyday life, especially as a parent, I may very well quote what the Apostle Paul says in verse 3 here of Philippians 2, more than maybe anything else in Scripture, to count others as more important than yourself. When I have the rare opportunity to talk with Audrina as a 14-year-old girl and she actually wants some advice, those words usually come out of my mouth at some point to remind her to count others as more important than herself. And as we'll see today, the Apostle Paul connects these ideas we'll see here of humility and unity together. That unity in the body, in a local body, requires humility. And these days, if I'm being honest with you, we as a church could use some unity. We could use some humility in some various ways. And the passage here that we're looking at, Philippians 2, looking at verse 1 to start, it begins with the word so, or the word therefore, depending on your translation, which connects what Paul is about to say with what Paul just said. Well, we can read our passage, Philippians 2, verse 1. He says this, So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. The previous section, which we looked at last week, the end of Philippians 1, is a section in which we were, uh, a section that which the Apostle Paul focused on our call to live as people who are worthy of the gospel. He even uses political language there as if to say, live as citizens, heavenly citizens on this earth who are worthy of the gospel. And to do so, Paul calls us to stand firm and to stand united together in the Holy Spirit, especially when we find ourselves in situations like those in Philippi where we're facing oppression, we're facing persecution, we're facing even difficulties and arguments within the church. Those are the things the people in Philippi are dealing with, and it's in those situations Paul calls them to stand in the Holy Spirit and to live as people who are worthy of of the gospel. We read Romans 12, a small section of that chapter earlier, which is one of the many texts in which Paul lays out this is how to live in a community. This is how to live as people worthy of the gospel. And so all throughout his letters, he calls people to live lives that have a higher standard than perhaps the non-believers around us. And Paul ends his last thought with a theological examination of suffering and encourages them to find comfort in Christ. And yet the theme that persists from that passage into this one we're looking at today is the call that the Apostle Paul gives them to be of one mind, to work together in their struggle for the gospel, especially, especially as they face persecution outside, or arguments inside. Let's look again at verse 1. So if there is any encouragement, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, 
Okay, well, with this, Paul brings back his appeal for unity that began in verse 27 of the last chapter. But Paul doesn't simply make that a straightforward appeal. He starts by pointing to their shared experience of Christ's comfort in their suffering, which directly responds to the fact that they are sharing in their suffering and doing so for Christ, suffering for Christ's sake. And he says here, if there is any encouragement in Christ, and the response to that is, well, of course, of course there is encouragement in Christ. Paul's not really questioning that. But he doesn't even immediately finish that thought. He says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, and then he continues to add three more sort of if clauses. If this, if this, if this. And that first clause focuses on Christ and what belongs to them because they are in Christ. But as verses 29 and 30 of the last chapter show, the comfort in Christ is something that Paul and the Philippians share together. And the next two clauses seem to focus on their experience of God's love and the Spirit's work. But again, Paul shares those experiences with them. By the time Paul reaches the fourth clause, which really lacks a specific modifier, the focus shifts more clearly to the relationship with him, and it leads to a command. And this is the central command of the text, complete my joy. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but we can take each of these if statements one at a time. If there is any encouragement in Christ... Paul starts his appeal by focusing on Christ, linking together their shared suffering. And just as they're suffering for Christ, as they're facing opposition, as they're facing persecution, as the world around them seems more and more hostile and dangerous to them, as their lives are increasingly threatened, as they draw closer and closer, some of them, to maybe unknowingly taking their last breath and becoming martyrs, They have comfort in Christ. They have encouragement in Christ. And this comfort is something Paul and the Philippians share. Paul has faced the persecution. He's writing from prison as a response or as a consequence of that persecution he's facing. He himself, though he's confident his tribunal, his trial will go well, knows that death might be around the corner for him. And he says there is comfort and there is encouragement in Christ. Paul's talking about a comfort that comes through Christ. That's not just general comfort. That is something that is a gift of God's grace. Especially as we receive that during suffering. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 5, Paul says, For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. We talk often about how we as believers are not called to a life of comfort. And when I say that, I usually mean being comfortable in the, pew, in the pews and not having to face much difficulty in life. We are called to carry our cross. We're called to go through this persecution and oppression that the Apostle Paul goes through, to even face those experiences with joy, knowing that God is bringing us to that suffering, to work something through us. And yet, at the same time, Paul says, we are also called to a life of comfort. But it's still not a life of comfortable pews and sitting aside and not really doing much and staying out of trouble. It's a comfort that happens in the midst of suffering. And it's a comfort that only comes from Christ. And that's powerful. And that's, that's an encouragement to those in Philippi. And it should be an encouragement to us. Because the call, especially as Westerners, especially as Americans, is to leave the comfortable pew once in a while and go do something uncomfortable. Go challenge yourself. Go do something to live a life worthy of the gospel. But the promise that comes from that is you're you're leaving a comfort, yes, to face this persecution maybe or to face these difficulties. But in response to that, you will also receive a different kind of comfort. 
And that's a, com a comfort that's far more valuable than the comfort you're leaving. So he says that in 2 Corinthians, and we go back to our text, and we continue there in verse 1, and the next phrase is, if there is any comfort from love. And Paul's continuing this theme of comfort, this theme of encouragement. There's a comfort that comes from love. But whose love is Paul referring to here? It's not entirely clear and you're reading the text, but it, it might be God's love that is poured out on the Philippians, and it's poured out also on Paul, that, that love that is poured out on them through Christ and the Holy Spirit, that would align with things Paul says in other epistles. In Romans 5.5, 5, he says, Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. And so I'm... I'm <clears throat> inclined to believe that's the same kind of love that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. God's love poured out onto them. In this context, in this Philippian context, Paul could be saying, well, if we've experienced God's love together, then show that love by completing my joy. We also see in verse 1 here, participation in the Spirit. If there is participation in the Spirit, here Paul returns to the idea of the one Spirit, the Holy Spirit that unites the people in their efforts for the gospel. The Spirit empowers them to live out God's will. And as that happens, we participate not just with each other in our gospel endeavors, but we participate with the Holy Spirit. And so the shared experience there is a, an experience of the Holy Spirit serving through us, serving with us, serving alongside of us. And then there's the final clause. If there is any affection and sympathy. This might be the most difficult to interpret. It, it seems to be here from the Apostle Paul an emotional appeal that lacks a real clear modifier. In chapter 1, verse 8, Paul already referred to Christ's affection or his compassion, as your translation might say. And that's a quality that Paul often associates with God, affection or compassion. It's possible that Paul is referring to the compassion and mercy that they share toward each other, which leads to this call for unity. In other words, if they've experienced God's compassion, they've experienced God's mercy, they should express those qualities towards God and towards one another. Just as if they've received God's love, they should express that love towards each other. Overall, Paul is appealing for unity and love among the Philippians based on their shared experiences of comfort and love and the Holy Spirit. All of those things having their source, their origin in God himself. And Paul here, he's, he's using this word if, he's using it rhetorically to make a statement, to make something clear. It's not that he's unsure if they've received those things. Paul knows these people, he's met with them, he's lived among them firsthand. For Paul, those things... Encouragement, comfort, love, the Holy Spirit, affection, sympathy. Those things are so clearly and obviously gifts that all believers receive that he's sort of begging the reader to say, well, of course we have those things. There's no question that we have those things. And that Paul uses rhetorically to sort of politely maybe insert this command to complete my joy. As Paul sees it, these are common gifts given to members of the body of Christ. These are, these are just a part of being placed into Christ's body, this body of believers by the Holy Spirit. And just part of that is you gain comfort and you gain love and you gain interaction, uh, personal experience with the Holy Spirit. And you gain this body of believers. So much of what the Apostle Paul has to say depends on community. 
And if you read enough Paul, if you spend enough time with the Apostle Paul, then you come to realize that the believers out there who say, well, I'm not going to go to church. I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to go to church. They're missing out on 90% of the good, wonderful things the Apostle talks about. Because so much of this is community-oriented. So much of this pushes against our modern individualistic mindset that we have. There's no question that each and every one of us who are believers, that we have these good, wonderful gifts to help us as we face trials of many kinds. The shared experience should lead them, and it should lead us as well, to a place of unity. As Paul now urges in the following verses. Look at verse 2. Here's that command, complete my joy. And then he says, by being of the same mind, by having the same love, by being in full accord and of one mind. Just as the power of this appeal of those if clauses of verse 1 sort of builds up and the conclusion of the appeal does the same here now with these repeated phrases. Paul says a few different things here. Be of the same mind. Have the same love. Be in full accord and of one mind. But that follows that command that's kind of right in between them. The fulcrum here. Complete my joy which again is Paul focusing back on the relationship he has with these people. That his joy is in these people. And I think, I think I really can understand what Paul's saying here because Paul is reflecting here the heart of a pastor. And sometimes you read Paul and, and you see you're reading like this brave, courageous warrior. Sometimes you're reading this unbelievable missionary sometimes it's this unbelievable evangelist sometimes it's this theologian sometimes it's this recipient of the mystery and sometimes you get a glimpse of paul the pastor pastor paul here because i like paul have a sense of joy that is deeply connected to the well-being of people in a local church which is you guys i have a a deep joy that I feel when I think of you, when I pray for you, when I interact with you, when I spend time with you, when I hear about the things you're doing in the world. There's joy that comes there. Even in the midst of suffering, together there's joy. His joy is deeply connected to the Philippians' well-being and their perseverance through these trials which lead them to experience God's final joy. Paul's joy is complete when they stand firm in one spirit, when they have this one mind. And this whole letter reflects this close, mutual love and joy that he has for these people a thousand miles away. He's calling them to unity, which brings him joy. And that's, for Paul, it's it's not really selfish. He's not saying, go off and do these things so I can feel good about myself. That's not the kind of joy he's talking about here. And when I see Audrina and the boys not getting along, which is kind of rare, but it happens. When I see them fighting and bickering and they're screaming and they're crying, that is heartbreaking. Not just because the screaming is annoying, but because they're breaking something beautiful, that sibling bond that they have. It's because I want so badly for them to be united as a family, as a family unit. And it's those moments when they, when they get along, when Audrina lets them into her room for a little while to play and to dance and to laugh and to close the door and not let me in. And they have their private sibling time and are clearly having fun together and it's not forced. That is when my heart just swells with indescribable joy. And that's what I think Paul wants, in part, for those in Philippi. It's what I want for us as a church. And it's what I want as a parent for my children. Audrina is 14, a 14-year-old girl in high school now, and the boys are eight. They might as well be the Romans and the Jews trying to figure each other out and come together here. They're in totally different worlds. 
And they have different perspectives on just about everything. And yet they can come together as one because they've, they've got that family bond, which is a powerful, powerful bond. But it's a bond that can damage and it's a bond that can break. And yet we as believers have a bond that can't be shattered. It's an eternal bond we have in the blood of Christ. It's far more lasting than any family bond could be. They can come together as one. And we as a church can do that too. And we can over overcome those things that divide us, whatever they may be, be, no matter how big and insurmountable they may seem. And we can play together and dance together and laugh together like my kids do sometimes. And when they do that, when they're in Audrina's room, what's happening, what I get just a glimpse of is that there is a, a purpose there. They're pursuing a common goal together to play whatever game they've come up with. That's the goal. That's what they pursue. And they're united in that. And that's what Paul calls those in Philippi to do. Find that goal. And he tells them what it is. It's, it's the gospel goal. And hearing all of this read aloud, as Paul's saying, complete my joy, complete my joy, the Philippians would connect it to earlier mentions of joy. Chapter 1, verse 4, where Paul prayed for them with joy. Chapter 1, verse 18, where his joy comes from the progress, the advancement of the gospel, even during his imprisonment. And now he urges them to complete that joy by continuing the gospel's advance in Philippi. And to do that, they need to get along. The complaints and the quarrels must stop. They must share a common view of life in Christ, showing love for one another. To do this, they have to be of the same mind or be like-minded is how Paul phrases it. We could translate this as to set your minds on the same thing. This doesn't mean they have to agree on everything. Nobody in the world has ever agreed with anybody else in the world 100% on anything. That's, that's not what Paul's saying, is you have to be brainless robots and just fall in line and agree, agree, agree with every thought everybody else has. The word he uses here has to do with the word for thoughtful planning. So have the same plan, have the same purpose, have the same goal. He uses the same word in verse 5 of chapter 2. He says there, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And that word there might suggest a translation for verse 5 that sounds something like, well, you think or you should think the way Christ Jesus thinks. Set your plan, set your focus, set your goal on the same thing Christ's goal was. Paul's asking them to have a united mindset that is focused on the gospel, a united front. That's one of those things Elise and I do as parents that's so difficult is try to be on the same page, which often means one of us has to sacrifice how we think something should be done in order to support our spouse, especially as parents, to be that united front. Sometimes I have to give up my expectations as we're dealing with the kids to support her. And so often she gives up her expectations or her opinion on what should be done to support me. And so you give up a little bit of that and you find the common cause, you find the common purpose, and you pursue it together as a community. Again, he's not asking them to have identical opinions to agree on every jot and tittle. It's being of one mind and one purpose. He says, have the same love, which connects to the earlier mention of God's love. Paul wants them to share this love with each other, reflecting the love that they've already experienced that comes from God. In verse 9 of chapter 1, Paul prayed for their love to grow, that their love would abound. Love isn't lacking, but it's in danger of being weakened for those in Philippi by the division. Paul calls for a full, complete love for one another, caring for others' needs over their own needs. As love begins when 
someone's needs matter more than our own needs. That is a place where love can can sprout and can really grow and take root. And then verse 3, Philippians 2 verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. So here Paul is addressing specific issues he suspects are happening among the Philippians. At least I think that's what he's doing here. This selfish ambition reflects the fallen human tendency to prioritize personal gain at the expense of others. People with this mindset not only oppose Paul, but they go against God, whose very son became a servant. And Paul makes that clear. You can look at verses 5 through 7. He says, have this mind among yourselves, of chapter 2, verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, held on to, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. As we look back to verse 3, this conceit here refers to this kind of empty glory that people award themselves without any real basis. It's very similar to the word pride, and oftentimes it's translated as pride there. In Galatians 5.26, Paul used this term to describe a church where people were constantly tearing each other down. And while Paul doesn't single out specific members of the Philippian church as being a serious conflict, he knows these attitudes, if unchecked, can lead to bigger problems. And these attitudes of pride, conceit, they stand in direct contrast to the mindset of Christ, who rejected selfish ambition by becoming a servant but also who rejected complete and full and inexhaustible glory to become a servant in human form and rejected conceit of any level by humbling himself to die on a cross. And this anticipates the fuller explanation of Christ's mindset that's there in verses 6 through 11, which we'll look at next week. The idea of humility that Paul mentions when he says to count others more significant than yourselves is a radical idea. It's radical today. It's even more so maybe in the Greco-Roman world. We, if you go around asking people if humility is a virtue, most people will probably say yes. They may not live like it, but they at least know they're supposed to say yes. But in the Greco-Roman world, Humility was not a virtue. It was a weakness. That was the unanimous understanding of humility. To be humble was to be weak. To be humble was something you were forced into. Never something you chose for yourself. But for Paul, who's rooted in the Old Testament, and he's rooted in Christ's example, humility means recognizing one's dependence on God. It's not about false modesty or pretending to be less than you are. True humility is about knowing both your weaknesses and your worth as somebody who is made in the image of God. And balancing both of those is difficult. But what Paul is asking us to do is to balance those. Your worth as God's image bearer, your worth as God's child, to balance that with your weakness and your sin and your shortcomings, shortcomings, and to do all of that without focusing too much on yourself. And it's quite the task. It's quite the, the thing that Paul is calling us to wrestle with here. Humility then looks out for others' interests as a priority over your own interests. And Paul learned this perspective from Jesus, whose humility showed his deep opposition to the self-serving attitudes of the Pharisees, the self-serving attitude he may have been tempted to, 
which saw him washing his disciples' feet like a common servant and then even dying the most shameful, cursed death on a tree. When you're being crucified and you're gasping for air and you're in pain to do so, to like stretch up a bit just to get a bit of air, and when you've been whipped and your flesh is torn and you're in unbelievable pain, and the people around you are shouting, get down. To be in that situation where you can actually get down, but you don't, that's putting someone else's needs over your own. That's putting all of our needs over his own. That's just one example of Christ doing that over and over and over again. And so Christ... God in flesh, perfect man, perfect being, stands in opposition to the values of the day, as he often does. The Philippians, and we too, are to avoid selfish ambition, to avoid conceit. And as true believers, we are called instead to love each other as Christ loves us. Paul is not saying to think that others are better than you in some false way, but rather to value their needs above your own. And if, if you do that, living alone and being separate and being isolated, it's tough because there's no one really there to love or to love you back. But when you do that in community, that's when that becomes possible. Because if I am devoted to caring for Dave's needs over my own, and Dave is devoted to caring for my needs over his own, then our needs are met. And we begin to do life and live life in community and to do so together. Paul's call to humility connects back to the main point in verse 2 about having the same mindset. And this is how true unity among believers is achieved. When people in the church, especially its leaders, are characterized by putting others first, that community becomes healthy and strong, and it avoids the divisions that arise from selfishness and pride. And lastly, we get to verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul now explains how to consider others in the believing community as greater than oneself. And by not looking out for one's own interests, but especially for the needs of others, Paul describes this as a genuine Christian behavior, where one does not seek for one's own good, but for the good of others. That's how Paul, as he says in Galatians 6, 2, can fully follow the law of Christ by helping carry each other's burdens. Here Paul shows the tension between the individual and the community, which I've stressed already. The community is always the focus. God's people fulfill their purpose only in community and only together. But unlike ancient Israel, where one became part of the community by birth in the people of God, newly formed by Christ and the Spirit, individuals now enter one by one into this body. And so Paul's teaching centers on the community, but obedience starts with each individual person. Each person is called into this community to care for others. Again, Paul's not saying to never look out for yourself, to never care about yourself, but to put others first. Paul's concern is that the Christian life, especially in relationships, should mirror the example of Christ, which again, he will describe and we'll talk about in the following verses next week. And this then is Paul's response to the petty grumbling and arguing in the Philippian church. This unrest not only weakens their witness in the city, but also their ability, as he said in the last text, to strive together for the gospel. This is a clear, small example of the heart of Paul's ethics, not just because it's rooted in grace, but because it's based on God's character as it's revealed through Jesus. And with so much in this letter, this is a message for today. And it's a message for us. And we can only imagine what might happen if we 
rethought or re-experienced the love and encouragement we have from the triune God, especially in how we relate to each other. If we truly embodied the message of this appeal, we might become a more effective people in the world around us. Let us pray. Father God, I ask that you would help us to be humble, that we might be united, that we might, in that unity, be of one mind, of one purpose, that we might love you, that we might love each other, and we might love those in the community around us, especially in a way that advances your wonderful gospel of grace. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.